Daniel, thank you so much for coming on the show, my friend. I'm really excited to talk about your book. Sounds good. I'm really happy to be here, Ben. Appreciate that. So I was just telling you, you did some great interviews recently with uh, Dr. Ken Berry, who's a friend of the show, a friend of mine, Dr. Philip Avadia, uh, as well, a friend of the show. And you have a new book that had just came out last year, The Unholy Trinity, How Carbs, Sugar, and Oils Make Us Fat, Sick, and Addicted, and How to Escape Their Grip. I can't think of a more important book during a more important time than this right here. But you, your story is what led you to writing the book. So share a little bit about what happened to you about four years ago and what led you down this path, Daniel. Yeah, well, uh, it's true. A few years ago, I, um, I almost died, I died from a heart attack. And I was a lean and symptom-free Mr. Healthy, or so I thought, right? <laughs> because I had um, no symptoms. I was on the lean side. And, you know, everybody knows that you know, if you're like that, there's no chance that you're going to have any kind of metabolic disease or dysfunction or anything like that. And it turns out that I, you know, I just had all these metabolic uh, situations going on. Main thing was, besides uh, what I discovered was the root cause source of my cardiovascular disease was the fact that I was a type 2 diabetic. Mm. I was a raging type 2 diabetic. And most people think that you have to be overweight or obese. It's true uh, that most people are that way, but there's a small like 1% or 2% that can be on the list slim side. And they call it TOFI, T-O-F-I, um, thin outside, fat inside. And they have you know visceral dangerous fat in the uh, visceral area, which is the most dangerous place to have it. So I had that, and that was the root cause, source of my cardiovascular disease. The, this, um, you know, undiagnosed, um, my undiagnosed, not only the diabetes, but undiagnosed cardiovascular disease, because I had the heart attack, and that was, you know, it's just, there's no symptoms, there's no signs. Um, most of the people who die of a first heart attack their very first symptom of heart disease is their own death. Mm. I mean, this is not something you want to mess around with. So that's why I, after I had the heart attack, I had all these tests done. And I found a lot of people on YouTube, um, you know, because I went to YouTube University yeah. and Google University and all like that to find out, you know, from all these different smart people, how did this happen to me? How did this, how did I get this, uh, you know, these chronic diseases? And I looked into all this. Fortunately, um, you know, I'm basically just a lower class street kid from Philly. And I was fortunate early on to learn how to study well so that I could conquer anything that I was really interested in. I, I wasn't like an amazing student, but if there was a certain topic that I wanted to conquer, I knew how to do it. So I jumped into all that, and I found all these geniuses uh, on the cutting edge of uh, metabolic health and the proper human diet and everything, and found out that I was doing everything wrong. I didn't know that, you know, for example, the, uh, the carbohydrates. I didn't know. I was totally bought into the propaganda of um, air, co air quotes coming at you, the uh, heart-healthy whole grains that turn into sugar when you when you ingest them. I didn't know any of that. And the reason why I call it the unholy trinity in the sub subtitle is uh, how carbs, sugar, and oils make us fat, sick, and addicted, and how to escape their grip. The carbs, I'm talking about the refined and industrially processed grains, which they then turn into bread, pasta, cereal, crackers, biscuits, waffles, pancakes, chips, pretzels, rolls, pizza, tortillas, and on and on that way. And then, of course, you got the uh, candy cake, ice cream, soda, fruit juice. I mean, never did we ever have any of those either, right? The, even the fruit juice. I mean, never did before did we have such a concentration of sugar just drinking it right down. And it's 10 times worth the, with the, worse when this, it's uh, in the form of soda. Yeah. Um, diabetes water, right? Yeah. And with the oils, it's as you, I'm sure you know by now, because uh, I've seen it on your channel, the, the vegetable oils, they weren't even in the food supply until 1865 when they were invented. Um, 
it was uh, cotton cottonseed oil, and it was invented as a um, <laughs> a lubricant for machinery, and it was just it was considered a toxic um, food or toxic something so- toxic to the body, and they started making you know, all these vegetable oils now. T- to be clear, there are some that are okay, like the olive oils and the avocado and that kind of thing. But I, you know, those got into the food supply very heavily starting at about 1911 with this product called Kiss Crisco <laughs> from these two guys that came from Europe. Uh, I can't remember their first names. It was Proctor and Gamble. And they came up with this thing called Chris, Crisco. And years later, they found out that it wasn't until the 90s that uh, Mayo Clinic discovered that it was, it was just ha- more than half of trans fats. And trans fats are the worst kind of fats you can put into your body. And so the combination together with the carbs, the sugars, and the oils is just... It's just why it's so deadly, and they're all addicting too. Yeah, the Holy Trinity. That's why you call it that. It's a perfect name for that. You're right, and when we look at the rates of obesity, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, it tracks pre- really closely with the incorporation of these, uh, the, the Holy Trinity, the oils, the processed foods, the sugar, et cetera. So I'm curious with your story, Daniel, what... Were you going and seeing your doctor, doing like an annual lab test report? Like there was no clues given to you that you were type 2 diabetic and that you were at risk of heart disease. I'm curious if you had regular appointments or what was the situation like before you had that heart attack? Well, I had uh, just passed (laughs) what you call a stress test. And that's why, um, you know, there's a guy, um, a wonderful, smart, genius guy named um, Dr. Ford Brewer. And I discovered his channel, and I got to know him. And he's out of Johns Hopkins, and he even had a book called, uh, what was it, Prevention Myths, um, why, why Stress Tests Can't Predict Your Heart Attack and Which Tests Actually Do. Mm. And so he was just at the forefront of all of this. And so I had asked him to, look, to uh, write this chapter in the book, which turned out to be chapter 22, and that is the, what are the most important blood labs and scans that anybody can get that your doctor might say, oh, you don't need that. You're fine. You don't need that. And the only reason they're telling you that is because they don't know what it is and they wouldn't know how to interpret it anyway. It's so true. <laughs> but, you know, and if they still won't do it, uh, then you can, there's a way I show in the book how you can order them yourself without needing a doctor's prescription. That way you yourself can find out if you've got something lurking, ready to pounce, uh, that coincides with maybe some something that is in your genetics that your family has, your mother and father and your Uncle Joe and all that. And um, so you can avoid all that. Or you, you get the test and you find out you're just fine. Or some pl- someplace in the between that needs attention, that you need to check out so that, that that way you can find out for yourself and you don't have to do- uh, you depend on your doctor because your doctor sometimes will go. And I'm not saying that you have a doctor like this or any of the person persons listening to this is that they might uh, think, oh, well, what are you uh, following Dr. Google now? Is that it? And if they're going to give you that, uh, that kind of attitude, that's not somebody you want to mm-hmm. uh, follow anyway. And you've got to say, hey, look, I'm the CEO of this body that I have. I got to find out what's going on. So, you know, I am going to go to Dr. Google and, and explore and that kind of thing. So, you know, you really have to be the CEO and the Luke Skywalker of your, uh, you know, you want a doctor that's going to be maybe like uh, a good advisor and they might look at some of the uh, things that you're giving them to look at, you know, for example, I have a chapter that has to do with um, osteopenia and osteoporosis. And that is coming into people much, much younger these days because of met- their metabolic health is going down. I think it's in the second, um, paragraph i'm talking about this new study relatively new that these are coming in to like 35 to 50 year olds and that's why i say look you got to get a, what's called a dexa scan it only costs about 100 bucks or and if your doctor tells you you don't need that because you're too young show him this study 
so yeah. that you know, so that they can go check that and make sure and you want to eliminate it. So important. Yeah. So you're right. The doctor works for, for, for you. It doesn't, the, not the other way around. And if they're not open or willing to do these tests, uh, your book talks about ways to get them, but also you find a new doctor, a functional doctor, um, a holistic doctor, somebody who's actually open to this conversation because you were going to the doctor. You did a stress test to your point. And you still had a heart attack with those markers. Let's discuss a few of the most important ones to assess risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. We know that total cholesterol is pretty meaningless. Even things like total LDL is pretty meaningless. There are more moving parts to the picture. So what are some of the tests that you would recommend that you talk about in your book for my audience to go get and request from their doctor? Very important. Um, in fact, there was a, um, a test from 2019 out of um, Johns Hopkins. And 2019 in the medical field is like you know 20 minutes ago because it takes so long for new science to get to the front lines of the doctors, let alone the, how long it takes to get into the, the, the curriculum of the medical schools, they found out that nine, uh, what was it? 74% of doctors, and we're talking cardiologists, um, internists and, uh, family physicians, you know, con you know, your conventional 74% don't know how to properly diagnose and test for pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, let alone know how to deal with it. Most of them, what they do is they will, they will test your um, A1C and your fasting blood glucose. Yeah. And even the uh, American Diabetes Association will tell you that if you're just going to test those two, you're going to miss 70% of the patients anyway. And so th there's another test that, that none of them, none of the doctors order in fact, I have uh, chapter seven is called the most, he most important health test you've ever had. You've never had, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, the most important health test you've never had because they don't order it. And what it really does is it, it determines how much diabetic physiology you have because all of the major killers, your heart attacks, your strokes, some cancers, um, blindness, PCOS, all these various silent diseases the original root cause of it is all from having a certain degree of diabetic physiology, which you want to avoid. And so you want to get this test called the OGTT with insulin, oral glucose tolerance test with insulin. And that will tell whether you're pre-diabetic, you're full-blown type 2 diabetic, or somewhere in between. And, um, you know, that, that way you can you know, start getting into going in the direction and following keto camp <laughs> and get off of the carbs, the sugar and the oils so that you can eliminate all of that and you can reverse your type two diabetes. It's not, it's something that you can reverse. It's not unreversible. That's the main thing you need to know. Yeah, that's very important to understand. It is reversible. Type two diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, PCOS. These are conditions that the body can um, as well equipped to, to deal with and to reverse if you implement the right things, which we'll talk about. So the OGTT with insulin, it's our oral glucose tolerance test where you drink about 75 grams of this uh, sugar-based glucola sort of thing. And then they test your postprandial glucose, so about an hour after having it, but also postprandial insulin, postprandial insulin, excuse me. And they see how well you are uh, doing at processing that high amount of sugar. And if it shows you're processing it poorly, that's a big clue that you are pre-diabetic or diabetic. Is that a fair way to explain it? Absolutely. Yeah. You have to do that. That's, that's why I went out on the, on the, <laughs> when I realized how important that was from Dr. Ford Brewer and all these other geniuses that are on the cutting edge of metabolic health and so forth, uh, I knew I had to emphasize that, uh, as well as all these others. And there's other ones in in that um, the chapter that Dr. Ford Brewer recommends. And but that's the most important one you want to start off with. And uh, once you discover that, then you can take these other tests. In so far as looking at the inflammation markers that most doctors don't check, and they're all in that chapter 22. And I have, I cover a lot of it. I have a whole section in the book in chapter, what is it, 17, 18, 19, and 20. That's where I go deep 
into the um, into the uh, metabolic relationship between heart disease and how all that is, and the difference between um, you know soft plaque and calcified plaque. <clears throat> The soft plaque is the dangerous plaque. That's the one that causes heart disease, uh, heart attacks and strokes. And the calcified plaque does not. And that's a whole other uh, thing that I cover in, in, 29, uh, in chapter 2019. But um, yeah, and, and it's so true. Like you were, um, you know, the statistics, you look at some of those that in 1930, the obesity rate was 1%. We're now approaching 50% according to the CDC and Harvard Medical and that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's less than 100 years. And never before in human history has a population gotten so fat and so sick. What the hell is happening? And that's why I like to give, uh, starting with chapter one, uh, the history of how this all this happened, where, you know, the, the, the it started with there was this fake science that, uh, started to be pursued by this guy named, well, I think you may have covered him. Uh, Ansel Keys. Name, uh, Ansel Keys. There we go. Our good friend. Oh, my God. The uh, He started this whole false information that it was. At the time, see, the, um, the ma- amount of people that were just being taken in the prime of their life was, uh, you know, it was just, if you look at a, from a, a a graph that I have in uh, that starting from the eight, uh, 1900, by the year time you get to uh, 20, I'm sorry, 1955, it's going like this. And they were looking at why was this happening? So he had, he came up with this thing. Well, it was the saturated fat that was clogging up everything. And it wasn't that way at all. He, he was the one that had this idea that he got across to people that, um, it was like a a, a, sh- a shower drain, you know, that was getting clogged up with, uh, you know, um, you know, all, all the soap and the the gook and the hair and the it was clogged up like like that. And it's not how it works at all, because it's all built. It all stores underneath the artery walls, not in the the lumen, where it's where the blood flows. It's not that way at all. So. He came up with all this and um, it was just really wrong. And he came up with the whole idea. You got to eat low fat, avoid, you know, you got to eat more carbohydrates and avoid the butter and the, uh, all that stuff. And so he's the one that that's where it stopped, started there. And then by the sixties and seventies, that's where all the, the high carb, low fat diet came in. And that's where you can look at the, the, um, the rate of diabetes, Started going like this, yeah. right? Yeah. It's date coincident with that. So it's it just was bad news. And he started it there. Because later, years later, they found out that it was the cause of the ep- epidemic of smoking that caused all of that. Mm. And that's what it was from. But by that time, everybody was believing that it was like a, a shower uh, drain that was getting clogged up with all the, you know, the clogging. He was very convincing, and we're still dealing with his uh, hypothesis to this day in 2024, which is absurd. Uh, a lie told often enough becomes the truth, and that is one of those lies that we're told over and over again. And still to this day, a lot of authorities are teaching that. But his his studies, this 22-country study that Ansel Keys did, he shared only seven of those 22 countries that fit his correlation. But even with those seven countries that fit his, his uh, hypothesis that the higher amounts of saturated fat these countries consume, the higher rates of heart disease, they were not even consuming saturated fats. They were consuming margarine and trans fats. And it was a whole bunch of lies. And it created something called, I, I call it lipophobia. And my, my definition of lipophobia is um, the fear of fat based off of 50 plus years of propaganda and misinformation. And the truth is the body loves quality fat. Uh, it, it, the, you know, cholesterol is vital for our hormones, it's vital for our liver, for our brain, for our, our cellular function. It's not the cholesterol that's the boogeyman, it's this holy trinity. It's the processed carbs, it's the seed oils, it's uh, the, the, the amount of the frequency that we're eating these carbohydrates. And that was your exact story. I mean, you 
that was your life. You were having the healthy whole grain carbs and it led to cardiovascular disease. And I think you brought up a really important point because I asked you about the markers for cardiovascular disease and you actually said the OGTT, the insulin, was the most important thing to get. And I think my audience might be thinking, well, Ben asked the question about cardiovascular disease. How does that relate to that? Well, that's the first domino to fall that leads to all the other conditions, including heart disease, high insulin levels. And the truth is, and I learned this from Dr. Philip Ovadia, there's only one cause of heart disease and that is damage to the arteries. That's it. But the reason that happens is multifactorial, but the biggest culprit is high amounts of glucose and insulin. So that's why you said get that test done because that's the first domino to fall, which leads to the, all those other conditions that you were referencing, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, and let me give you some reason behind that. Um, yeah. The smoking causes and destroys, um, not causes, it destroys what's called the glycocalyx. And I covered this when Dr. Rovadia had interviewed me. We covered this. And smoking de destroys the glycocalyx, which is this fuzz-like um, coating of the artery walls and it discovers that and that makes it and the glycocalyx was always uh, prior to that was always the first defense against small dense ldl particles from invading the artery walls and getting stuck underneath and causing plaque deposits over time and so that was what was calling it and the the but the other thing that causes a destruction of the glycocalyx is the carbs and the sugar and the oils they, they're the, you know, all the sugars and the carbohydrates from your bread and pasta and all that, because, you know, throughout our history, these bodies that we have, um, you know, we're used to having a diet that was consisted of what we could catch, kill and eat nose to tail. That was our diet for what? Hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. And we didn't even start eating grains until about 9,000 years ago, as you know. And by the way, I got to give you a lot of kudos and big hugs for giving your audience of all this because you were way ahead of me at all discovering all this and passing this correct information on to people and how the carbs and the sugar really destroy the glycocalyx and which leads into the uh, hyperinsulinemia, which then leads into inflammation. And the inflammation of the, uh, of the arteries is what... That's what you need to check for. And your average doctor and even a lot of cardiologists don't check the right markers. And I have all those in the book too. There's uh, myeloperoxidase, MPO, LP plaque 2. There's microbiomic creatinine ratio. I mean, you don't have to write them down or anything, but there, I have them, have them all in the book. I cover them in, in my chapters as well as Dr. Ford Brewer's. And those I call smoke detectors, right? Mm. So you want to check those to find out if your artery is on fire and, you know, you need to remove those uh, kind of things. You've got to check those first to see where you are, see if you're in danger or if you're just fine. Because when I, you know, when I first found out all of these, after my heart attack, I decided to get a lot of testing done because I wanted to have a, a benchmark to you know, measure where I was so where I, I could p compare in the future, like three months, six months, and so forth. So I could have measure my uh, progress in the future. And so I did that. And then I got all these different tests to find out so I could measure things. And I did that fortunately. And so that I could find out another thing I found out was that because another thing that I had because of the uh, diet, uh, the type two diabetes that I found that I was undiagnosed with was it was also caused the root cause source of my um, undiagnosed fatty liver disease. It was called NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty, fatty liver disease. And that is very deadly because I had this thing called elevated GGT. And the reason why it's so deadly is because, and most doctors don't even check that. No. They might check some other kind of... Um, ALT and AST maybe, but... Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah those two. Uh, but they don't check the GGT. And the, re the reason why it's so important is because life insurance companies 
They want to know, because it's just business to them. They're less interested in medical science. It's just business to them. They want to know what is it that is the number one predictor of all-cause mortality. And it is having highly elevated GGT. Really? That's what they that, that's what they consider? That's what they found out high. Yeah, if you got elevated GGT, I, and then the studies you look at, it's so closely related to cardiovascular disease. And then I realized, wow, that's why I had this um, cardiovascular disease, because I had such bad... Let me tell you, first of all, the levels are supposed to be under 65. Mine was 265. Wow. And it was just like, wow, it was just way beyond. And then it was all because of this thing called high fructose uh, corn syrup, which I had no idea was in a lot of things that were in my pantry. I didn't know that, you know, I was looking at the ingredients and they were in this and that and the other. And that's what that caused for me, you know, because they were, there's even studies that showed something like, I think it was like, you can develop fatty liver disease in about two weeks to two to four weeks if you just start adding that into your diet in a heavy duty way. Oh and uh, so, you know, you got to find out these things. Oh my gosh. And the cool thing about the liver in particular, it's the, uh, one of the rare organs that could regenerate a hundred percent, even if it's lost about uh, up to 75% of its function, it can regenerate back to a hundred percent. So even though you very could, forward, yeah, yeah pretty, that's good. And the liver is, uh, I call the liver, the soccer mom organ, because it does so many things for us. And a lot of people don't get, you know, what the role of the liver on metabolism, right? It, it's, it produces bile, which breaks down fat, helps it with your metabolism, detoxification. And I'm glad you brought up the GGT. And I think for those watching and listening, uh, that's important for you to get those liver enzymes done, get the ALT, get the AST, but get that GGT. And as you were sharing that, yours was over, you said yours was over 200 when you uh, tested that time? 2665. Two, yeah. 265. That's insane. I'm looking at mine. I just did a test about a month ago. Mine's nine, right? So that's pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm curious. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm curious for you. Were you able, what was the, have you tested your GGT lately and have you reversed your type 2 diabetes? Oh yeah, you can, it, it can take a long time or it can take a long time. It took me a long time for, for whatever reason, I don't know. It went from 265 to 230, down to 195, down to 165. You know, I kept texting it and uh, testing it and it took me two years to get down into the normal, which is great. I got um, into safe levels and everything else a lot, lot quicker but that GGT, it took, because I had that much dan- damage yeah. because it is, I was in big danger because like I said, the life insurance, uh, these act- life insurance actuaries, they're just interested in saving money. So they don't, so they don't have to lose a, they want to know what are screaming, what are the markers that scream mortality risk? So they got to know who to reject, who to reject and who to accept but you can bring it down like I did. It took a while, but I got into the safe. Um, I'm, I'm in good levels now. So, yeah, it can take a while, but that's why you have to start texting, te- testing things right from the start. Yeah, so important. C- cholesterol is a big um, topic these days, total cholesterol. It's probably the most common question I get asked on my social media. Like, hey, Ben, you know, I started doing more fats and keto and carnivore per your recommendation. And my cholesterol went from like 180 to 280 or or from 250 to like 350. And my doctor is concerned uh, that my total cholesterol is, you know, elevated and he, he or she wants to put me on a statin or thinks this diet is dangerous for me. Can you share your thoughts on total cholesterol and why people actually um, live longer lives with a good amount of cholesterol? (laughs) That's right on, Ben, because you know that people with high cholesterol live the longest and those with low cholesterol die much earlier and usually of some form of cancer. It's just crazy. It's just Mm. backwards. It reminds me, you know, people get these false information in their mind and they just get locked in on it. It reminds me of Mark Twain, uh, who was the king of uh, common sense, right? And he has this wonderful quote. What was it? Uh, I'll say it twice so it sinks in. He said, it's easier to fool people than to convince them they have been fooled. <laughs> it's easier to fool people than to convince them 
hey, you've been fooled because they get an idea of certain things in their mind. They start believing that, oh, well, it's kind of like a shower drain that gets clogged up with the hair and the grease and the soap and the, and the, the you know, the more saturated fats you eat your, and the higher cholesterol you have. And it's not that, in, you, ha- you can't do it in context. You have to, you know, if you've got, I'm, I personally am what's called, what's they've discovered as it, you know, it's called lean mass hyper responder, mm. where you Me can too. have high cholesterol and even high LDL, but you can have high HDL, which is the very healthy, good cholesterol, which is very protective. And, you know, it actually helps sweep away the bad cholesterol. And I should uh, clarify that a little bit too, because most doctors, they lump all LDL, the so-called bad boy cholesterol, into one category. There's two types of LDL. There's the pattern A and pattern B. Pattern A is the large, fluffy, harmless LDL cholesterol. cholesterol, And the pattern B is the small, dense LDL particles that can invade the artery wall and get stuck underneath in what's called the intima media space. And that's what builds up the soft, dangerous plaques that, the plaque that can build up and cause heart attacks and strokes. Minerals, minerals, minerals. You hear a lot of people out there speaking about the benefits of taking minerals. And it is important because in this day and age, our crops, our fruits, and our vegetables, they are depleted of minerals. So you've heard of the keto flu. You've heard of symptoms doing keto and fasting. People just don't feel good sometimes. This is the number one reason why. So my go-to for replenishing my electrolytes and my minerals, for enhancing my immune system, for gut support, for detoxification, is bean minerals. It has fulvic and humic compounds, and these have over 70 trace minerals and really important electrolytes to replenish your body with. Check out bean minerals over at beanminerals.com. Use the coupon code Azadi, my last name, at checkout to get a nice discount. That is A-Z-A-D-I at checkout over at beanminerals.com. Is that your favorite? Is that your favorite metric to, to test for soft plaque? The small, the pattern B LDL particles. It's one of the best ones. Yeah, it's uh, the the test is called NMR Lipo Profile. Yeah, and most doctors don't know about it, and you can buy one online. And it, you know, the way it works is real simple. Just so your audience knows, if your doctor doesn't um, order it, you can get any of the anything on your own. I tell you which uh, labs you can buy online. What you want to look for, you got to whip out your credit card and pay for it. They send you a, an email, <clears throat> excuse me, and you print it out. You take it to your local lab, which is, you know, either LabCorp or Quest Diagnostics, which are thousands of around mm-hmm. the country and even around the world, where you can get that done. And then you have the blood draw done within a couple of days. And then you get your results within two or three days after that. So it's easy peasy. You can find out if your um, doctor won't order these things. So you want to get those. You want to get this NMR, stands for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance um, Lipo Profile. So that way you know if you've got the healthy LDL or you've got the unhealthy LDL. You know, at first, I, and what, what low-carb and keto diets do is they make those small, dense LDL particles, the pattern B, they turn them into cat pattern A, which are healthy, and they're good for you because the they can help clear out these small, dense LDL particles in this process is called um, HDL efflux capacity. That's a technical thing. And I, you know, I have a lot of science in the book, and it's just, I, you know, but I write everything for the average reader of health and wellness because... You know, even though my book has more scientific references and citations than any other health book out there, I mean, if they have any, they have two or three hundred. I have twelve hundred and twelve, uh, twelve hundred and twenty-seven citations, wow. and and you know, so I'm told, and I think I am pretty good at taking what can be complicated science, but explaining it to a, a for the average reader of health and wellness, and when I Put it, put it together, and I thought, I need to write this for my, like, Uncle Joe or my brother Dave, because they're not uh, scientifically inclined or technically inclined. I want the average person to understand that they can do something about it, 
And then they can take steps and go, oh, wow, that's the one. I understand it now. Because I'm, you know, you don't make a lot of money from writing health books, but I have become very wealthy when I hear back from people from all over the world saying, mm-hmm. wow, this is really great. This has helped my life. This is all the, it's now an international bestseller. And so I try to that's give awesome. all of the, the things that people can use and think with and go, oh, wow, now I really understand what hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance is. Because you got to understand what that is and you got to have, you have it, you can't explain it in terms that are just too technical. And so that's what, that's what I strive to do. I love that you do. It's so important because that gets to the masses, right? It, 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 if we get too technical, it goes over people's head uh, heads. And um, your book is a great resource for the average person. Uh, everybody get the book. We'll reference it. We'll put a link down below. I want to share, I just did 90 days of uh, carnivore diet. Or I did an experiment and I did lab work on day one. So I did a $3,500 lab court panel day one, day one. stool wow. test day one. I put on a continuous glucose monitor day one. And then I ate nothing but protein and saturated fat and, and animal products for 90 days. And then I retested on day 90. And I'm going to share my results with you right now. I'm putting together a whole podcast and video, but the audience could get a sneak peek. But I think it's relevant to what you shared here. On, on day one of the carnivore experiment, I was already doing, you know, mostly keto. Uh, my total cholesterol was 297. My triglycerides were 69. My total LDL particles, like all the particles together, was 2,150. Oh! <laughs> How, and then my total LDL on day one was 222. So if, if we just looked at that, the average doctor, they think, dude, you are going to have a heart attack. But then I got the NMR done, as you mentioned. The majority of all my LDL particles were the pattern A, the large and fluffy. The small dense was 491, right? So it was actually within range. And this is day one. Then I did 90 days of carnivore. And then my, let's talk about that. My total cholesterol went from 297 on day one to 434 on day 90. My total triglycerides went from 69 to 78. My total LDL went from 222 to 350, but my small dents, the pattern B, actually reduced after 90 days. <laughs> wow. Fasting there insulin. You go. Yeah, fasting insulin 3.3, 3.4, C reactive protein under one, homocysteine signal jidditch, right? So, if I didn't get all these markers done and I just looked at total cholesterol and total LDL, I'd probably panic and be like, what did I do to my body? But to your point and your book's point, a lot of moving parts here. And that's the purpose of why I wanted to do this experiment. No, that's wonderful because, you know, you have to see most, most doctors don't, they don't get this information. They just don't. Um, well, even Do- I appeared on, uh, Dr. Ovedia's, uh, uh, his channel uh, last month. Well, actually, it was, uh, let's see. Yeah, it was last month. And he asked me a question that was very revealing as well as kind of <laughs> validating to me, too. He said something like, and remember, he's a cardiologist. He's done, he's a cardiac surgeon. He's done over 3,000 heart operations. So he really knows his stuff about cardio, cardiovascular health as well as uh, metabolic health, too. And he said, he asked me, he says, how is it that you, as a non-surgeon, were able to figure this all out when 99% of medical doctors can't or won't? I'm like, wow, what a question that was. And see, we explored that. He has his opinions, and I had some ideas about that, too. I think some, just to mention my opinion a little bit, I think some doctors that they, they just think, they must think, and I don't know because I haven't done a survey, I think they think that they have the mentality where well, if they didn't teach it to me in medical school, it must not be that important enough. Yeah. Or, you know, uh, or if I'm supposed to know about nutrition and metabolic health, I, they would have taught me that. I don't know. Again, I don't haven't done the survey, but, you know, they just don't explore that and they don't learn. Um, you know, I had to learn this <laughs> the hard way. I had to have a heart attack before it said, I, look, my business the biggest regret is having to have this life-threatening event to place me on this path. And, um, you know, I just want to avoid all that. And if I can pass along to the other person 
doing this and following those kind of things that I discovered that I almost lost my life on, then, hey, that's what I want to do. And mm-hmm. uh, bravo again to you for what you're doing insofar as pointing out the ancestral way to eat, how we've, eat, we've been used to eating for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. It was high fat, low carb, and that's the way it was. Yeah, exactly. I, I no, I, you, your pain to purpose is so important. I'm glad it turned into this. I'm not. I'm not glad you had the heart attack and went through that, but I'm glad that it led to this because it's so important to have this resource for the for the masses to to read and to implement, especially with disease on the rise. One of the one of the most common things they do with um, these arterial blockages is to put in a stent. In your book, you talk about why about 85 percent of stents are unnecessary. And if, if you could explain what exactly they're doing with the stents and why it is unnecessary most of the time. Okay, whoa. Here's another one that uh, this kind of relates to big food where they just come up with all these addictive foods for money, right? Mm-hmm. It's all for money and profits as opposed to what's good for human beings. Yeah. In the cardiovascular area, they wanted to, there was a, a a trial called the ischemia trial. And it was this large hundred million dollar government funded trial um, where they had 5,200, almost 5,200 people they put into two groups. One had invasive procedures like open heart surgery or stents. And the other one was more of uh, lifestyle changes. You know, losing some weight, getting to the gym, changing your diet, <clears throat> dropping 20 pounds, that kind of thing. Maybe with some blood pressure medications, that kind of thing. So they had the two groups. And they basically wanted to prove that it was these invasive procedures, open heart surgery and stents, that were the answer and how you prevent heart attacks and strokes. And so what they did was they followed these people closely for four years and they found out there was no difference. <laughs> they failed. They'd even said, it says they, this test failed to show that these invasive procedures like heart, open heart surgery with bypass surgery and stents are preventive measures. And they're not. They're no better than the, you know, the lifestyle changes and so forth. Same with another one. It was another large study, study card the, called uh, the Courage Trial. And then there was another one in, uh, called the Orbita Trial. And these three, the, the headline that should have come out and that did come out was that these invasive procedures do not prevent heart attacks and strokes. <laughs> they don't. And so then I ask, I say, so do you think because um, this was the result you think these invasive procedures will now come to a halt? <laughs> no way. <laughs> and the answer is there is so much of an enormous amount of revenue generated by these mostly unable, uh, um, unnecessary procedures. It's 85% are done for those reasons and only 15% for emergency situations. And let me be clear, they can be lifesavers. If a person's having a heart attack, they're in some in, in emergency situation it's 15% of the time where they can uh, save somebody. The other 85% of the time is done and they don't, they don't need it. And so I cover all this in chapter 17 and it's just like, and you would think that they would at least kind of taper off a little bit after the, the graph is going up like this on the number of um, invasive procedures. And so it's, and it's, again, it's because, if you eliminated those invasive procedures, there are careers and institutions that would also disappear. Yeah, I'm sad. I'm sorry to say that, but you know, you you get rid of those, and there goes <laughs> there goes the country, the, the 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 mountain retreat, and the the beach house, and the kids in Ivy League. You, you get rid of. They gotta go because the, you can't afford those anymore. Because you've got to do all of these invasive procedures that they've bought into. And look, I don't know what their mindset is, if it's nefarious or that. I, I can't give you any opinion on that because, again, I haven't done any surveys, but this is what the science shows. And that's why I always, always have it in, uh, I like to put it in there, the chapter 17, 18, 19, and 20, what the truth is about what it is. And then that way, if your doctor is recommending one of these, 
you can then send the study to your doctor and they'll know, number one, they'll know that you know, now that you know, and number two, you can say to them, okay, so explain to me again why you want me to do this, right? <laughs> and see what they say. So, and then you want to get a second opinion and you want to find somebody like Dr. Uh, Ford Brewer or Dr. Orvedia or Ken Berry or something like that so that you can get the, the truth of the matter and not what the big money makers are. So true. Uh, the writing is on the wall. If you look, you're going to find it. I mean, the statin industry, last year they made over $13 billion in 2023. So they don't want us to know the truth. To your point, there's a lot of money to be lost when people start realizing that cholesterol is not the boogeyman we've been taught to believe. You, you had mentioned, Daniel, that Soft plaque is an issue, and I agree. You said the calcified plaque is, is not much of a concern for you. Is that what you said? It, it, are you, uh, can you share, share a little bit more about that? Yeah, I cover that in Chapter 19, and this is cutting-edge re edge research that a lot of uh, cardiologists don't know because there's two studies in particular that come from the top two places on the planet for cardiology. One is Cleveland Clinic, that's ranked number one globally for cardiovascular care and the American College of Cardiology, which is the top school on the planet for cardiovascular disease. And they, there's two kinds of tests uh, that you want to get. You want to get the test, for, the test for soft plaque, which is called Echolucent or um, compared Echolucent plaque with um, Echogenic plaque. That's the hard and the calcified. And because, the heart, again, the soft plaque is what causes heart attacks and strokes. Cleveland Clinic, um, when you're testing for the calcified, that's a good test. It's called the CAC test, coronary artery calcium scan. And But what they point out is, and you never hear this from cardiologists or anybody, is that the result of the CAC scan, the number that you get, it's a good test to get. But what it represents is there's four times as much, approximately, four times as much soft plaque as there is calcified plaque. And what happens is you can get a, um, a not good score the first time you get one. Let's say you get, it's supposed to be between a zero and 400. 400 is bad, but it can go much higher than that. For example, I had 600, and, but I didn't know anything about the soft plaque. And so what happens is you can get this calcium scan and you have this bad number. And then you spend a year or two getting in, you know, intermittent fasting, you do in low carb keto, you do some, you know, you really get much healthier and your arms, your, your arteries really get healthy. And what happens is when the body gets, the arteries get healthier, they lay down calcium. And so what happens is, for example, I'm the perfect example of this. What they call it, what these researchers call it, is they call it um, the buildup of the R. They call it the CAC paradox or the uh, plaque density paradox. And it's not a paradox to the researchers or the doctors. It's a paradox for the patients because they think the higher, the better. So after you've spent a year or so getting healthy, you take that test again like I did. My first one was 600. Year and a half later, after like, you know, getting really healthy and everything, I took it again and it shot up to 2,500. Hmm. And even Dr. Ford will tell you, he says that, look, this is exactly why we don't recommend getting a second one because people are ready to, we have to talk them off the, the yeah. off yeah. the, uh, the, you know, uh, committing suicide or something. I think they're going to die. But what happens is, the analogy that the um, Cleveland Clinic gives, he says, look, it's so, pardon me, you get all this calcium built up and you have to think of it as an iceberg where the tip of the iceberg is the calcium and what's underneath is the soft plaque. That's the dangerous plaque and you can't see that. That's what brought down the Titanic, right? They even give this this analogy, they give this analogy, they say, look, this is uh, like an iceberg and the danger is underneath the surface. It's not what you're seeing on the number. So you can have a score like me, like I had 2,500 after I got healthy. 
And that meant that I was now, I had calcified plaque instead of uh, the soft, dangerous plaque. Because this, this is what happens. When you have soft, dangerous plaque, it can rupture through the endothelial or the lining of the artery and spill into what's called the lumen, where the blood flows. And when it touches blood, it creates a clot. It goes downstream, so to speak. And if it goes to your heart, you have a heart attack. If it goes to your brain, you have a stroke. And that, that shows you right there that it can come from any place in your body. It's not just your heart. So you want to, uh, th that's why the, the, um, the soft plaque is so dangerous. So anyway, it's the tip of the iceberg, but you do want to get the calcium scan, but you don't want to pay attention to the coronary artery calcium paradox or the plaque density. This is the data that the cardiologists, many to this day, don't know about. And it's right out of the Cleveland Clinic, which is the top place on the planet for cardiology, car cardiovascular care and the American College of Cardiology. So there you go. Yeah, this is really interesting. And I've seen this um, with a friend of mine, Eric, who's, uh, they, they call him Keto 5 -0. That's exactly what happened to him. He, his, really? He, he went keto, he went healthy, carnivore, and it shot up, and he was concerned. And this is making sense to me now. But I, I have, you know, this is, this is, I'm learning this as well, so I'm glad you shared this. So I'm curious, if somebody's getting a calcium score done, is it only looking at calcified plaque, but not soft plaque? Correct. Well, well, the stable datum or the statum idea you want to understand is that where is it in their transition that they're getting it? Are they have, they, have they already done like a lot of healthy movements in order to put the calcium there to, to, uh, to fortify it? Or if it's right in the beginning as one of their initial tests, the CAC scan, then, you know, it, it's, there's a better test for that. It's called the CIMT, carotid intima media thickness test. And this is a pretty amazing test to check for the, um, the soft plaque. And that's in chapter 19, too. I cover all of this in chapter 19, which ones you want to get and all that. So, but all you need to know is if, if you do get the CAC scan, um, then you just have to know that you have four times as much soft plaque underneath the surface that your cardiologist thinks, oh, well, you got the calcification and that's what's going to cause. It's not that. It's the soft plaque. You have four times as much and that's what's going to cause your heart attack or stroke. What if somebody, and that's really good info, by the way. Thank you for that. What if somebody yeah. gets a calcium score and it's a zero? Well, depending on their age, they can still have some uh, dangerous... Soft plaque. Uh, uh, calcified plaque. So that's why you can't just do one test okay. in a vacuum. You have to check a, a, a battery of tests. You got to check your microbiome and creatinine ratio. You got to check your myeloperoxidase, your LP plaque 2, your F2 isoprostanes, your on and on. There's a lot of these markers that are in the book that say, look, you want to, you can get these if your doctor doesn't order them. You can buy them yourself and check where they are. This is, and yeah. so you want to get these most important ones that, again, our average doctors just don't check. And uh, and it took me to have my heart attack. <laughs> so don't be like me. Find out what's going on inside of you. That's my big message. Don't be like me. Find out what's going on inside with the proper testing. Emphasis on the word proper. And, you know, there you go. And, and follow your channel. <laughs> I love it. Well, do yeah. You, do you remember, Daniel, before you had your heart attack, if you were getting some lab tests and they were looking at um, any inflammatory markers like homocysteine or C-reactive protein before that? No, 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 no. Just your standard. No, I wasn't. There was no. There was no. Well, look, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. You can have a lot of uh, misreading there. You can have false Correct. positives, false negatives. You can have had a uh, cold or flu a few days before yeah. and it's off. Yeah. Um, you know, so you can't just test high sensitivity C reactive protein. You got to check these other inflammation markers to get the, again, it's a, it's a battery of player of players and blood labs that you got to check so that you can understand what's the full picture here. I agree. I was just curious to know if they ever tested that before you had the heart attack, but yeah, you're to your yeah, point. No. There's a lot of moving parts here. 
Well, I didn't have them only because my the doctors that I had at the time, they're just the typical physicians yeah. who don't know these latest research and latest uh, uh, you know ways of diagnosing things. Yeah, so true. Where, where can uh, the audience get your book? Where's the best place to get it? <laughs> well, I would say the, uh, the best thing to do is go to danieltrevor.com. And that way, they, I have a seven-minute video where they can hear my story and maybe some shocking statistics like you, you know, we've covered here in a little bit. As well as I have, uh, I had my, um, my uh, what do you call it, website guy, IT person, I guess you call yeah, it. tech guy. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I had him mount the interview that I had with Dr. Ken Berry because that went viral. And that's the one that made my... Uh, my book go to number one on Amazon for heart disease, number one for uh, type two diabetes, and number one for longevity. So That's I'm like, awesome. wow, this is amazing. And again, like I said, you don't get rich, high, uh, you know, selling health books. But I have become very wealthy hearing back from people all over the place that are just you know changing lives and th- that kind of thing. I'm thinking, wow. That's why I wrote it, because I want people to understand this thing and not follow your standard directions from your diet doctors who don't know the proper latest science. And so you can understand and go like that. So anyway, DanielTrevor.com. And I also have, uh, they're also going to see all of the amazing, uh, what do you call them? testimonials and uh, not testimonials, what do you call them? endorsements from these people like Dr. Ford Brewer and, and all these other people on below the video that shows I have their pictures. I have what they said. And, uh, I love the one that uh, Dr. Ovedia has for me. I even have it here. Let's see. He says, and I put it on the back of the cover on the top cause they filled the it back with, he says, he said, uh, to anyone who doesn't want to see me or one of my colleagues <laughs> standing over them in a hospital bed, read this book. (laughs) So that was a little, you know, endorsement. So I I really, I got lucky with that and I feel flattered and fortunate for that. So, you know, go to danieltrevor.com and you can also get a free preview of the book. And what that is, is the first 48 pages of the book. That way you can check it out and, um, you know, from there. And then you can, there's also a button where you can click order it on Amazon. So, I love anyway, it. we'll put it down below. Yeah, Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Berg also endorsed your book. Some big names, um, which speaks volumes to you know the work that you did. And you mentioned how you don't get rich from from selling books. It's true, but the form of wealth you do get is that psychic wealth. You know that satisfaction, and that's exactly what you're experiencing, and it's so well deserved. Hey, I want to just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. A sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. Also, it's going to cause you to sweat. And one method of fleshing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release. Every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60-minute massage. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. Head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket And actually, any of their products are 15% off with that code. All right, let's get back to today's video. I have a final question for you, Daniel. Yeah. I talk a lot about gratitude. I call it vitamin G. And I believe it's uh, anti-inflammatory, great for the heart, great for the metabolism. And I want to ask you, what are you grateful for today? Well, I'm grateful that I found all of these, you know, geniuses that found out what I didn't know to help me heal. I found them on, on YouTube. Um, I found people like you, like Dr. Ford Brewer, like Ivor Cummins, uh, Dr. Philip Ovedia, um, you know, all the Nina Tykoltz. I found all of these people online. I go, wow, this makes so much sense. And since I was already pretty smart, because I learned, like I said, early on, I was learned how to study very well. And, um, and like that. So just, you know, follow the statistics 
because you got to go by the statistics that what can really have and what have cured people. And I'm one of them. Amen. You're living proof. We'll put your website down below, Daniel. It's danieltrevor.com. The book is on there, Unholy Trinity. Uh, go get the book, share it with a friend, gift it to somebody. So important, this conversation. So please consider sharing it with somebody you know. If you're watching on YouTube, leave a comment down below. Daniel, thank you for uh, living your your pain to purpose and, and l allowing us to benefit from your experiences. And I'm excited to see what you do next. And uh, you're helping a lot of people, and it's so important. Arguably, this is this is like what we need to do to put a dent in disease when disease is on the rise. It's books like this, it's conversations like this. If you enjoyed that conversation, be sure to watch this next video all about visceral fat and the top ways to blast belly fat. A biomarker called visceral fat, and it's the earliest expression of chronic disease that occurs in the human body. You should be wondering, when does it start? And the answer is visceral fat, and it begins in your childhood.